Welcome to Metcalf Institute's 25th Annual Public Lecture Series. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Metcalf's Executive Director, and I'm joining you today from the ancestral and current homelands of the Narragansett and Eastern Niantic Nations. Their lands and waters originally encompassed what is now the state of Rhode Island into Eastern Connecticut and Southern Massachusetts. We pay our respects to elders past and present. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been advancing informed and inclusive public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We achieved this through science training for professional journalists, communications training for scientists, and public events like this one. We also founded the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together researchers and practitioners from across the world to make all types of science communication more inclusive and equitable. This year's lecture series, as you can see on the slide, explores the unique challenges that inland and coastal flooding have created for the physical and social infrastructures that sustain communities. Climate change is causing more frequent and intense precipitation and flooding events around the world. We see this in stalled hurricanes that dump unimaginable volumes of rain over the course of just a few days. We see it in so-called hundred year storms that are now happening much more frequently. And we see the impacts play out in many ways too. These impacts from outdated infrastructure to the loss of homes and livelihoods are felt disproportionately among low wealth communities and communities of color. This week, through discussions of flooding risks, infrastructure, flood policy and planning and community action, we will investigate the far-reaching effects that flooding can have on communities to further understand how to support equitable community-based solutions to the increasing challenge of major flood events around the world. We want to thank you all for being here today to further explore this critical topic. I also want to note that thanks to our generous advisory board, Metcalf Institute has a dollar for dollar matching opportunity this month until June 30th for all donations up to a total of $11,000. Your gifts support public programs like this one, as well as training opportunities, all in the interest of advancing conversations that increase awareness and action on the urgent challenges posed by climate change and environmental inequities. If you would like your gift automatically doubled, please click on the link that we will share in the chat momentarily. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now, to today's lecture, which is setting the stage for the rest of the week's events. Currently, an average of 3.6 million people in the United States are exposed to flooding events each year. According to a recent study led by today's speaker, we can expect a roughly 20% increase in exposure to, exposure to flood risk in the coming years because of climate change, which will affect more than 4 million people annually. To tell us more about this, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Oliver Wing. Dr. Wing is Chief Research Officer at Fathom, a private firm that provides global cutting edge flood risk modeling. Dr. Wing received his PhD from the University of Bristol in the UK, where he developed and tested novel flood hazard models. He continued this work as a postdoctoral researcher in the hydrology research group at the University of Bristol, improving and further developing large-scale flood models for global use. He still holds a position with the university as an honorary research fellow, while ensuring that Fathom's flood risk mapping technologies remain research-based, transparent, and peer-reviewed by academics in the field. Dr. Uh, Dr. Wayne continues with his role in academia also as a reviewer and publisher for major hydrology journals, and he regularly speaks on issues related to flood risk and climate change and we are very pleased to have him talk about those issues today. Welcome, Dr. Wing. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me just share my screen. Are we there? I think we look good. Okay, well, um, thank you to Sunshine and the Metcalf Institute for the invite to this lecture series. I'm very honored to be invited to speak here. Um, and thank you for the glowing introduction. You did, did most of the job of my first slide for me. Um, I'll just repeat, my name's Ollie Wing, the Chief Research Officer with the Flood Risk Modeling Firm Fathom, and also a Research Fellow at the University of Bristol. So in this talk, I'll be discussing the recent advances in flood modeling capabilities at large scales, how we go around, 
understanding the historical risk as well as the future risk and understanding the implications uh, of the translation from hazard to risk that these models can tell us. So this talk is, is creatively entitled Mind the Gaps, Accounting for Present and Future Flood Risk. And we're going to be gap minding across many dimensions during this talk, across space, across time, across frequency, across race, wealth, demography, all sorts of gap minding. So more of that to come. Before I get started, it would be remiss of me not to discuss who found them are. I'm just this guy from a, from a private firm talking to you about flood risk. Um, we were founded from the University of Bristol's hydrology research group just under a decade ago. Um, and I'm biased, of course, but I'd be happy to give you both quantitative and qualitative evidence that we are the best research group in the world studying uh, global flood risk. Um, and I guess it's important to note really that Fathom continues to operate much like a university research group. All of our methods are peer reviewed and published in high quality academic journals and all of our data are freely available for academic researchers to use. And indeed we collaborate with researchers globally as well. And the reason why I emphasize this so much is because of that text in, in red there is that it's relatively recent really that businesses have started showing material interest in, in climate risk, um, whether that's for reputational reasons, for regulatory reasons, or another reason why they, why they care about the risk posed due to climate change. But with this new demand, uh, there have been a bunch of so-called climate service providers have sprung up to meet this demand. Um, and academics are becoming increasingly aware of organizations that are doing this, and they can be typically characterized as having opaque methodologies, uh, very, very closed models. So we don't necessarily know what's going on under the hood. And that reference there, Tanya Fiedler et al is, is a good example of academics sort of getting to grips with how their data are being used and indeed misused in private industry. So Fathom essentially exists to be a bastion to that trend. Um, we think honesty about the state of the science, what it can, and crucially what it can't tell you about risk at different scales. Um, is very important. So to dive in, um, you've got a nice little animation on your screen there. I often think being a flood model is more, more an artist than a scientist job. We can produce very pretty images, which I'll be repeating throughout this talk. Um, but this is a very local scale model. And I'll be charting the story essentially of how we travel from the local scale to continental and global scales when it comes to flood modeling. So the, the one on your screen there is a flood that hit Des Moines in 2008. And even though it looked pretty, in many ways, there's nothing particularly interesting or innovative about this model. Um, computational flood models have been ubiquitous over the past half century or more in managing risk at local scales. We understand the physics of how water moves down channels and across floodplains and have done for hundreds of years. Um, the thing that makes it tricky when scaling it up is that these models are incredibly data hungry. Um, they need accurate and precise information around all sorts of things um, that I'll get onto. And those equations that underline the hydraulic models are very expensive to solve. So it makes, makes these models very difficult to scale. So to talk you through some of the building blocks of how you go about building a typical flood model, you start off with elevation data um, and an example of excellent data source for this is LIDAR, so often uh, you might have heard it as a laser altimeter, so that's a plane flying overhead, shooting lasers at the ground, working how long it takes for that laser to return and therefore getting a, a very nice picture of what uh, the Earth's terrain looks like. We also need some mass input to that model, how much water are we going to put in at the top to work out how it's going to flow over the floodplain. Often we have stream gauges that tell us this and that forms the input to the models or boundary conditions to the model. Another crucial element is channel bathymetry. So um, whether you've, you've gone on a boat and measured it or put your waders on and got some measuring sticks out, we need to understand how deep the channels are, what the shape of those channels are. If you don't have that information, um, the model can be extremely overpredictive. Rivers obviously convey the bulk of flood flows. And so if all of that water is just dumped onto the floodplain without conveyance down the channel, um, you get a very overpredictive picture of what the flood extent might be. 
And then the last thing in my simple little schematic here is that you need a core set of equations that tell you how water moves from A to B. Um, and as I mentioned, there's, there's lots of different codes that, that do this, HECRAS being one. Now, when it comes to the global outlook, these key components are essentially missing. We don't have river gauges everywhere. In fact, we have it in, we have them in very few places uh, and it's declining, surprisingly, the number of river gauges that are in active operation. The US has a lot of river gauges thanks to the, thanks to the US Geological Survey, um, but by no means is every river covered. We also can't see beneath the surface of rivers from space or from air, so that makes the job of understanding channel bed elevations uh, quite difficult. High quality elevation data. Now, elevation data, as you can imagine, is the most important part of a flood problem. There's nothing new in the, in the physical equations that tell us water moves downhill. Uh, we need to know where downhill is. And if we don't have data that's reliable to tell us that, well, then the model is pretty unreliable as well. So uh, the, this LIDAR data is, is the gold standard for uh, wide area elevation data building. Um, but the reality is that it just doesn't exist over enough areas. There's quite a lot of it in the United States and in Europe, but by no means do we have a seamless national picture. And the last problem is that these codes that were developed um, to essentially solve the equations of water flow, as I mentioned, are quite expensive and that makes them very difficult to scale. So this creates a problem in how we go from those nice looking large, uh, small scale models, I should say, on the left, uh, and scale those up to cover an entire nation, a continent, or the world. And it's a problem that the federal government has really struggled with. Um, now, the federal government charges FEMA, a, a government agency, to map flood hazard zones across the United States. Now, the purpose of doing so is simply um, to work out which, which homes um, have to buy flood insurance, which is also federally managed. So while it was not intended to be a risk communication product, it has essentially become synonymous with that in the view of the public. So according to FEMA, they've mapped 60% of the contiguous United States. Um, a recent report from the Association of State Floodplain Managers suggests that only one third of, of stream miles have been modeled. Of that one third, one quarter have recently been modeled or updated. So we've got around 8% of US rivers with an updated flood map. And it's taken FEMA and their engineering contractors over half a century to get to that number and over $10 billion to do that as well. So this is where our, our large scale modeling science comes in. It's gap filling. It's taking these, these patchwork of local scale models, working out where those gaps are and filling those in. And there's a, a pretty nice pictorial example of that here where we have the FEMA 100 year hazard zones that are delineated uh, by local engineers. And then the model that we built, and we didn't even have to leave Bristol to do it, and here's how. So some of those key components that I've already touched on have been uh, addressed either by us or, or by other scientists or by, <laughs> by something else. One of those key things always is uh, the availability of computers. Um, I've mentioned it so many times now, these models are very expensive. So if we can throw more computers at the problem, we can suddenly start to simulate wider areas at, at, at finer details. The other key advance is a hydraulic model that's been developed at the University of Bristol since the turn of the century. Um, and that differs to other hydraulic models in the sense that it is not full complexity. So it doesn't tell you everything about how water moves in three dimensions. It essentially retains the terms within those equations that are most relevant for flood inundation modeling and discards essentially overly complex terms that don't make any difference to the thing that we're trying to simulate, which fundamentally is, is flood inundation and depth. And the, the main things that have allowed us to create a model of this scale in the US is data. Data is, is always the limiting factor in these models. I've mentioned how data hungry they are. And so we couldn't have got there, we couldn't have gotten there without the US Geological Survey and without NOAA releasing a whole bunch of very critical data sources and publicly. Again, the most important one of those is the US Geological Survey's uh, 
national map of, of, of terrain, um, a lot of it of which is LIDAR and increasing, although a lot of it isn't. Also the US geological surveys, uh, river gauge data, river location data, uh, all sorts of other very critical observations, tide gauges, rain gauges, and so on. Without the availability of this data in, in well-maintained databases, uh, the, the whole endeavor would have been pretty hopeless. And then another element of gap filling that uh, essentially was pioneered by, by Fathom and, and our research group at the university is statistical models to fill in the gaps where we don't have observations. So that's what hydrologists call regionalization. Um, so where we have observations of, of flow, of, of river flow in, in one catchment, but not in another catchment, we use those catchment descriptors to predict what the unobserved extreme flood might be. So of course you shouldn't really listen to anything I say unless I can prove to you that the model works. Uh, model validation is essentially the, <laughs> the only important thing when it comes to, to, to communicating science, as it were. Um, if I can't tell you that these methods work or <laughs> at least provide some evidence as to what their skill is, uh, then it's quite difficult to use them. Um, so we've done a whole bunch of this. I'm not going to go into loads of detail, but I'll give you give you some flavor of it. But one of the tests that we applied to this model was to compare it to those local engineering models. Um, so as I've mentioned, they are only a patchwork of the national picture, but where they exist, a lot of them are good quality. So we take the ones that are high quality, compare those to our uh, flood model output, which you can sort of see pictorially there, and then we get some measure of fit to that. So one such score is called the critical success index. Um, this is the only <laughs> boring metric I'm going to talk to you about, which is essentially a quantification of model skill out of one. So on this map here, we've got uh, a, a map of, of, uh, of flooding from the Iowa Flood Center, and we've got three types of pixel, as it were. The blue one is a true positive, so that's where both our model and the Iowa Flood Center agree that that area is at risk of the 100-year flood. The false positive, which is where we've over-predicted what the Iowa Flood Center think, and the false negative is where we've under-predicted. And then you get a score out of one using that equation on the left. It's, it's relatively simple, really. Um, and I guess it's important to set expectations for what that number should be. We, we don't want to get one. Getting one would be essentially rewarding the replication of noise. But the benchmark data and our model are subject to error. They're uncertain. Uh, and so you can only realistically obtain a fit of 0.8 or so at, at best. Um, and indeed, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 um, is around what we get when we compute these metrics at a national scale. So against the Iowa Flood Center's uh, engineering grade models, we do quite well. Similarly, with the FEMA 100-year flood map catalog as well. We've also validated against observations. You know, Model-to-model -model comparison is, is circumstantial, really. Uh, both models share biases. So can we actually reproduce observations of those floods? Um, here's an example here of uh, a flood that hit Omaha a few years ago, as observed by uh, planet satellites, and then our model simulation of that. Again, we can compare the two using that same metric. So in, in a more recent study, we did that for nine flood events, which had observations. Again, thanks to the US Geological Survey for those observations. And we get a pretty nice fit score. Um, for Hurricane Harvey in a separate paper, it's a little bit lower, a very tricky flood to model that one. Again, a bunch of observations from the USGS that we could benchmark against. And I guess the, the other important thing are the types of floods that we simulate. We have fluvial floods, which are rivers. I've focused a lot on the river end case thus far, um, but pluvial floods too. So that's where uh, it doesn't really matter where the rivers are. There's just so much rain onto the, uh, onto the earth's surface that <laughs> it, just, it just follows the terrain. Um, and we've seen that with recent, recent floods from tropical cyclones. Hurricane Harvey is a good example. There was just so much rain in Houston um, the water just ran over the surface, regardless of the stream locations. And these are floods that are generally not modeled by uh, FEMA or uh, typical engineering flood maps. So that's an, another important gap filling. And then there's coastal floods as well, which may be caused by high tides or, or storm surges where events have occurred. 
And so the early indications of the gap between this patchwork of local scale studies and the large scale approach back in 2018 is, is a factor three. If you count up the people living in the regulatory flood zone, which delineates the 100 year flood versus the one that we've simulated, you get quite a stark difference there. Now I'm cognizant not to beat the federal government with a stick because they haven't been using technologies that weren't available to them. Um, this, this science is relatively new. People in the, in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s um, could, could not have done this. Uh, so we shouldn't be too critical of them. And indeed, some are starting to, to, um, to open themselves up to these new technologies. So for example, we've worked with the Texas Water Development Board who um, were well aware of the shortcomings in, in the coverage of the engineering maps that they've been using. And so they'd use our model as the kind of base map for this floodplain quilt and then overlay the more detailed localized studies where those are available. Now, ubiquitous by its absence, I suppose, conspicuous, I should say, by its absence, is the phrase climate change, which I actually haven't mentioned thus far, uh, despite being the topic of this entire lecture series. So the engineering models and indeed uh, the large scale model I've been telling you about have failed to recognize that because the climate is changing, therefore so is flood behavior. Um, and that's a problem. That's another gap to be filled. So I'll just take you through a short journey really on what the IPCC report of last year says about the effect of climate change on floods. So I put in um, a graphic there from the IPCC's World Atlas. So what that shows there is the annual maximum one day precipitation accumulation and how it's going to change in a two degrees world versus one of recent history. Um, so you can see those greens are where it's going to increase, the browns where it's going to decrease under a, yeah, a, a, a very predictable scenario, as it were, one, one that isn't um, an extreme one. And this was simulated by CMIP-6, uh, a 32 model ensemble on which the conclusions of the IPCC report is based. Um, and this is yeah, fairly, fairly incontroversial, almost fairly obvious that a warm world is a wet world. Um, we, we have pretty well established physical relationships between um, temperature and the, the water holding capacity of the atmosphere. The Klaus's Claypon relationship dictates that for every one degree rise in, in, in atmospheric temperatures, there's a 7% holding capacity increase uh, of water in the atmosphere. Um, and that holds particularly for extreme floods, that scaling. Indeed, at very local scales, it can even be as high as twice that. Um, so we're, we're, we're pretty confident, really, that pluvial floods are going to go up due to climate change. What complicates the picture is river floods. Um, more rain, as I put there, does not necessarily mean more river floods. Um, if, if rain and river flow was the same thing, the whole field of hydrology wouldn't exist. Um, how much water reaches the channel uh, as a proportion of the rain that fell is precisely what hydrological models try to do. And it may well be, for instance, that um, a warming world leads to drier soils in the catchments, and therefore they can absorb more of that increased rainfall and actually mitigate much of that increase. And the models that do that translation are, are very uncertain at large scales as well. So we get a very mixed, very uncertain picture in how we think river floods might change due to climate change, even though we're pretty sure about the increase in rainfall. And then the coastal question, we can, we can quibble about whether we'll get more or less or stronger or weaker surge generating storms. Um, but the reality is that coastal floods will increase in most places because the base level from which these floods start to occur is increasing sea level rise. Um, again, a fairly, fairly uncontroversial thing to say. But the thing that's difficult is we've got a massive gap to mind here. Climate models are not really set up to tell us anything about floods. Uh, it's just simply not what they were designed to do. So in this schematic here, um, I kind of show you across those dimensions what it is that we as, as flood modelers, as risk modelers, need to understand and what global climate models are designed to do. So we have global climate models are very, very good. Uh, and indeed, it's what they're set up to do in telling us about long term changes out towards the end of the century. They're very good at large spatial scales, by which I mean 
continental and global generalizations of changes and for more frequent events, so averages. That's what climate is, it's an average. They're very good at describing average conditions. What we need as flood modelers is the diametric opposite to that. We need to understand transient local extremes and these models are not set up to do that. Um, and, and again, by definition, models are, are simplifications of, uh, of the physical system and lots of processes that are relevant to floods, such as convection, uh, are either omitted or parameterized within these models. So it makes their relevance to the problem we're trying to tackle quite difficult. Now that requires an application technique, so to speak. Um, and these come in lots of different flavors, but they generally uh, try and essentially project climate model output onto a higher resolution grid or, or on a higher, a greater temporal scale to try and obtain accuracy for the things that we're looking to get, but they really are no panacea. So what we've done, our application technique, is taking that validated historical view of floods and updating that um, using the relative changes coming out of climate model cascades. So for instance, if we were interested in how pluvial floods would change, we would look at the relative change in rainfall between a baseline period and the future period of interest. And then we would iterate that relative change across the boundary conditions of our historical model. Um, and in that sense, we've corrected any, any biases because the baseline period and the future period in the climate model will have a similar bias. Um, and in essence, we're downscaling it by applying it onto uh, an already locally relevant model. Um, and so what I've shown here, for instance, in A is the, the, the present day map of, of flooded area across the United States. And then this is the change. Uh, and I should say that's the, for the 250 year flood. Uh, and, and B shows you how that area changes once we've applied um, these relative shifts to those model boundary conditions, um, which is perhaps relatively intuitive on the coast and in Florida. We see quite big increases in those flooded areas but lots of places see uh, very little change or indeed a decrease across the central United States. And I should add, this is under um, the RCP 4.5 scenario. So again, a, a relatively conservative one. We're not, um, we're not using a, a extreme scenarios in these projections. So I guess onto the, 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 the stuff that's of substantive interest, which is risk. Uh, I've spoken a lot about how we actually understand the hazard uh, but risk is the tangible thing that we want to learn about. So we've taken an inventory of buildings and, and structures across the United States. We know their locations, their characteristics, their values, all that sort of stuff. And we've also applied vulnerability models. And, and those are um, perhaps simpler than, than <laughs> the name model suggests, which is where we work out conditional upon being flooded to a certain extent and conditional on certain amount of characteristics being defined. This is the kind of damage response we would expect these buildings to experience. And when we sum that for every structure across the United States, integrate across all the return period floods uh, that we've simulated, we get an average annual loss of, of the present day of around $32 billion. Um, now the, the national distribution of that is, is obviously very heterogeneous. Um, we can see perhaps quite intuitive hotspots in, in the red map there, um, in the Gulf Coast, in Florida, and populated areas of the Northeast and, and the West, and perhaps less intuitive hotspots um, across Appalachia and, and the Northwest too. Also of interest, I suppose, is that 41% of this, this national average loss is occurring within the FEMA flood zones. So what this means is that the majority of the nation's flood risk is essentially unknown to the federal government, um, which I suppose is quite concerning. When we look at the future case, so this is um, the, the map in blue there, we see a, an increase of around a quarter in 30 years, uh, up to $41 billion. Now that's, you know, 26% increase is a lot, 30 years is not a lot of time either, but we're not seeing massive shifts, you know, Come 2050, the majority of flood risk will still be historical risk that has failed to be dealt with. There's still that 32 billion figure 
uh, that hasn't been drawn down across decades of, of risk management practice. And that distribution of increase, again, perhaps might be fairly intuitive along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts where sea levels are rising and, and, and hurricanes are dropping more rainfall when they make landfall. Also of interest is that the increase within these federal risk zones, federal FEMA, FEMA zones, I should say, um, is higher than those outside of it. So when we get on, we, we, we can zoom in quite a lot here. We've got risk defined uh, at, in essence, every building structure in the United States. And we can start to look at who are the people that are actually bearing this risk uh, and, and, and how are they? And in many ways, this is, this is quite a stark picture. So on the right hand side, the very right hand side, we have that very tall dark green bar, which represents the relative risk of, uh, of communities that are both extremely impoverished and have a high proportion uh, of white people living within them. And they bear an extremely outsized burden compared to the national average, as you can see. Uh, indeed, that, that bar on the very left-hand side, the sort of light green, uh, light green one on the far left represents the least white, the least impoverished communities, uh, and they have risk that's, that's 10 times lower. Now, this is, says nothing about the, the sort of relative vulnerability of these populations. So, you know, generally, it's poorer people that struggle to respond when these disasters hit that might get less access to federal aid and so on. This is just raw numbers that, <laughs> that, that they bear the most risk, let alone have the least capacity to respond to it. That distribution is, is shown uh, in the bottom there, um, particularly across Appalachia uh, and the Ohio Valley, for instance, are where these very high risk communities relative to what is relative to the value of buildings that are there. Um, is found. We can also look at what, what the climate shift is. Um, now, this is not to say that risk by 2050 will be completely turned on its head. We're, we're not charting new patterns of 2050's risk in these plots. We're talking about what is the delta, who's bearing the increase. And we can see in this image that it's communities that have a high proportion of Black people. So in the top quintile, of uh, black census tract population are experiencing the biggest climate shifts, um, two times more than the least, uh, than, than communities with the lowest black population proportion. And again, you can see the distribution of these across the deep south, which is again, where we expect hurricane rainfall to intensify, sea levels to rise and so on. Another important point that arose from this body of work was the importance of population and, and projecting that. Sunshine said at the start, 3.6 million people are exposed to floods each year, just over 1% of the US population. But when we start to look at how that changes and the relative contributions of these changes, we get a very interesting picture. So we've used population projections from uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency who have gridded census bureau population projections um, so we can essentially have an idea of where we think uh, people of the future might be living um, and we've counted up the number of people um, that, that are exposed to floods each year whether they're present day populations or future populations and whether that's present day floods or future climate change floods and if you if you take a view of all of those components our risk almost doubles, in fact. And the reason why that's so much bigger than the 25%, 26% increase that I mentioned previously is that population change is a huge determinant of what future risk will be. It, it, it accounts for three quarters of it. Um, under 20% of that change by 2050 is expected to be due to climate change. Um, and that's a fairly, fairly incontroversial and, and, and well-defended aspect of, of this modeling. Indeed, lots of other models of different scales uh, and in different regions generally see that it's actually people and where people are expected to be living that will drive the climate risk of the future. I also want to point out the interesting little yellow bar at the top, which accounts for 6% of the change. And this is where both climate change and population growth are required to 
to produce that extra bit of increase. So conceptually, you can think of that as, um, as future uh, places right now where nobody's living and also aren't at risk. But both of those things are going to change by 2050. So there's, there's considerable <laughs> risk of surprise in places like that. But overall, the, the point of this slide, of course, is that demographic change is, is four times uh, more influential on your view of risk than climate change. A little note on uncertainty then. Um, I kind of have alluded to uncertainty in, in previous slides, but to be a bit more explicit about it, the models that we've used to project these future changes, we, we took not only the median of these climate models, but we also looked um, either side of that median. So what, what's, what's the 25th percentile of these changes? What's the 75th percentile of these changes? And if we look at essentially the disagreement amongst these models in trying to characterize what the risk of today is, so, so what, is, what is the present day climate? That variability is much greater than the trend. Um, so essentially what we're saying is that uncertainty in characterizing the present day is much greater than uncertainty in whatever might happen in the future. And, and that's pretty important that the climate change is essentially noise amidst existing uncertainty. It's of course important that it imposes a bias and, and an increase generally, um, but it still stands that models of history or of the present day are still subject to considerable uncertainty. Now, what I've shown in these maps here is a really stark view of flood model uncertainty, regardless of, uh, of, of the climate outlook. So we have relative risk plotted by each county now that big map is our median. Um, and then the other two are essentially represent the 95% confidence range. And you can see within counties, that's a lot, a lot of uncertainty. So at, at these local levels, um, because of errors in flood modeling, be that quantifying what the 100 year flood is, is subject to a lot of error. The terrain data is imperfect. Uh, there's missing flood defense information. We don't necessarily know how much water channels should convey. All sorts of errors uh, are inherent to this modeling exercise. And we provided a view of what that uncertainty would look like at a very local scale. Um, so in many ways, this should be used as a warning uh, for the use of data of this nature in, the, in understanding really that at, at, a, at a very local level, these models and in especially models that try to account for climate change are deeply uncertain at a very local level. Um, the fortunate thing really is that as you aggregate out, um, you, you essentially get greater confidence. So um, for instance, all of these county level errors, if we assume that they're uncorrelated to some extent, um, then the, the ones that are over predicting and the ones that are under predicting might cancel out. Um, and therefore at perhaps state or, or, or national or continental scales, your uncertainty bounds do tend to shrink. So you, you get a clearer view as you aggregate. But that of course is in um, perhaps opposition to what uh, this, this newly con conscious financial sector and, and business sector want to use this data for. So that was a, a lot about problems, I guess. Um, I'll, I'll touch a bit on solutions really. Um, because there, of course, are solutions. Um, what I've shown at the top there is the, 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 the climate trajectories of, of this century, according to the IPCC. Um, and of course, we've only projected flood risk out to 2050. And you can see that the one that we've used, that orange line, SSP2 4.5, really doesn't differ very much to these other scenarios over the coming years. Um, and so there's not a lot of mitigation action that, that, that can be taken to, um, to, to buy down the risk that, that we've projected here. Uh, it's risk that essentially has to be adapted to. And mitigation is going to be useful to stop the longer term impacts, but what we've projected is near term, so it's adaptation. Um, and there are a whole, whole raft of policy responses that are possible. Uh, within the umbrella of adaptation, some, some simple and obvious, um, some hard and expensive and, and require difficult questions to be answered. But I guess the most obvious one really is if there are any natural floodplains left, which of course there are, 
don't build on them. We, we did a study a few years ago, actually, with the Nature Conservancy, who uh, we essentially worked out that you could buy up at market value all undeveloped natural floodplains in the US right now, and that would be less money than uh, the inevitable flood impact should they ever be built upon. Um, so it's it's a very, and, and that's buying it up, right? It doesn't need to be bought up. We could have land use planning zoning policies that prevent that from happening. Uh, we can move people out of floodplains. There's plenty of examples of, well, I say plenty, there aren't that many, but there should be more examples of successful relocations of communities out of risk zones, quite an expensive one. For those who remain retrofitting them to be more flood resilient so that when the floods do come, they can get back on their feet quite quickly. Uh, a big, big topic of this lecture series is, of course, um, equality and, and, and how we can equitably respond to these climate risks. And, and one such tool in, in our arsenal is an expansion of the federal flood insurance program. At the minute, um, not that many people have flood insurance. It's only people that are uh, within those FEMA flood zones that have to buy it. Some voluntarily do buy it, but more people need it. And it needs to be affordable and equitable because in many places, the actuarial risk is, is too expensive for some communities to, to pay for. Uh, and that's why some of these other tools will be important. And of course, there are structural measures that, that, that need to be employed where appropriate, but there should be an understanding that when these structural measures are used, that that doesn't eliminate risk there's still residual risk behind flood walls. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't dream that we can engineer our way out of this problem. So that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Please do continue the conversation with me via email. Um, and I look forward now to what I hope will be a, an interesting Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ali. We really appreciate you being here to share this with us. Uh, there was a lot in there, and um, the <coughs> questions are uh, starting to come in. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of take them as they come, even though it means we might jump around a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so Jane asked, do you expect FEMA to be able to address that 60% data gap that you mentioned? Are there efforts to do this? And if yes, what would that look like? Does, does risk 2.0 change this in any substantial way? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think FEMA will be able to address this, not, not using traditional approaches, so they're not going to be able to uh, suddenly fill that massive data gap with local engineering great models. Um, and the crucial point really is that those models, once you've built them, they're sort of instantly out of date as soon as they're built, if you haven't accounted for climate change. And there's no, um, there's no legal requirement for these maps to do so. Um, which is, of course, problematic too. Um, and the fact that, again, that they're built at the local scale in a time consuming way makes them difficult to update for these future views. Um, so it will be using, you know, not necessarily our data, but, but data from this, from this frontier of science to fill in those gaps. And they are starting to do so. Um, and they referenced risk rating 2.0, which is, um, methodologically at least to step in the right direction where they're starting to leverage um, you know technologies like this to fill in that data gap um, but crucially they're only really using that for for pricing the risk as it were that the, the models underpinning that are not open we don't understand the methods that that go into risk rating 2.0 at, at their core um, and ultimately you know uh, as a risk communication product, as working out where's at risk, um, as kind of a public facing map, risk rating 2.0 doesn't address that. So we're kind of in this, this weird limbo really where we have, um, you know, pretty, pretty um, well, up-to-date science as it were, even if black box informing the pricing of insurance, but still the consumers of this have no additional information beyond these 100 year flood maps. I wonder. So, um, I wonder if you would care to comment on the issue of accessible and inaccessible data in general. Um, this is something that you and I had talked about a little bit on the side, and I think that it's it's a really interesting conversation for people to be more aware of. Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, ultimately, we can only be resilient to the kind of stuff that I've mentioned here 
if it's out in the open, right? And we can only use data or we should only use data that, that we can trust and we can only trust it if that data is open to be looked at, to be scrutinized by experts in this field. We're currently in, in charting quite, well, we're treading on dangerous ground as it were, because we're in, in new territory. We have um, private industry are suddenly extremely interested, um, more so than they ever were in physical risk and in climate risk in particular. And as I mentioned at the start, there's lots of firms that um, offer solutions to that, to, to meet that demand. Um, but when, when you boil down their methods, they're taking open climate model output, repackaging it in some way to make it look prettier and then selling it on, um, which is deeply unethical and, and not scientifically defensible either. And I, of course, worry that when, when the mask is eventually peeled back and, and the public sees it for, sees these firms for what they are, that we may end up going in completely opposite direction and the increasing climate consciousness that we're seeing from individuals and the public um, may, may well evaporate when they see how certain, certain people are using certain sets of data. Um, and so that's why shining a light on the methods and the data that are being used is so important. Thank you. Um, Catherine asked uh, about the, the locations of the especially vulnerable areas. So um, do we know where those areas are and what kinds of surprises have your models found in this regard? So we, we do know where those areas are. Um, of course, they are subject to uncertainty. I talked a lot about location level uncertainty in particular, um, and we're projecting these, these future floodplains as it were, and also an extremely uncertain bit of, of, of understanding that is the projections of where people are going to live. What we have from the Environmental Protection Agency are, um, are, are a single realization of where people might be living by 2050, sort of consistently with how, how the climate is changing, well, how, how is the population changing at the same time? The reality is we'd quite like um, an ensemble view of that, lots of different views of where people could be living. Um, rather than a single one. So although our model could tell you, well, you know, that, that compounding yellow bar that I described where we have the nexus of population growth and climate change, we can, we can see those where they are at some precision, um, but whether we treat them with a whole bunch of accuracy or, or whether we trust them is, is a separate issue. And here's kind of building on that. There's a question from, and I'm so sorry, I think I might be saying this person's name wrong, Brysa, 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 um, who asks, is part of the reason that risk is currently concentrated in areas with more white people due to low property values held by communities of color? If so, is it possible to calculate the risk differently to help contextualize in terms of communities rather than property? For example, for community planners rather than insurance assessors? Yeah, a, a really good question. And it's it's tricky to, to tell a story in an objective way because you can you can present things in terms of raw numbers, you know, and it's gonna be fairly obvious that where there's lots of people, you're gonna see darker colors on that map because, <laughs> you know, people have got to intersect with these floods for risk to be generated um, versus the kind of relative risk that, that uh, the question alludes to, which is, uh, proportional to what is there, what is the risk? And it's in fact that latter thing, that um, that latter quantity is, is what we showed when it came to, um, when, it, when it came to illustrating the, the poorer whiter communities that are most at, at risk. So what those maps showed and what, what, what was on that bar graph in essence is the total, the annual damage within these communities as modeled divided by the total value of all the buildings and, and contents and, and those sorts of estimates that are there to produce that kind of relative risk. So we're seeing that people to essentially show us who's bearing more than their fair share of this national risk. And, and that was the distribution that we saw. But the question is right that you could, you know, paint a story in a very different way. Thanks. Um... Another question is about um, some surprise at seeing um, increased flood risks in parts of the country that are experiencing a great deal of drought. So California, for example. So can you talk some more about that um, sort of surprising result? Yeah, I mean, 
the the increased prevalence of drought is is not does not necessarily preclude increased floods. Um, indeed, it's, it's not necessarily my specialty, but um, you know there there are increasing lines of evidence, particularly in California, uh, a phenomenon called precipitation whiplash, which is where we see big swings from one extreme to the other between drought seasons and flood seasons. Um, and indeed, if you can conceptualize a sort of normal distribution in your head where you have you know, your, your mean rainfall at the center and your extremes either side, which represent floods and droughts, we're seeing, particularly in California, a widening of that distribution. So we can see more extreme droughts, but also more extreme floods. So one absolutely does not preclude the other. Thank you. Um, another person asked, uh, to what extent does your model, if at all, take into account infrastructure updates, um, both gray and green infrastructure, uh, as cities or municipalities install these infrastructures? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. It doesn't at all. Um, and in many ways, that's both a, a practical and a conscious choice. Um, we're, we're essentially trying to, to show what would the state of the nation be like under climate change? So if only climate has changed. And of course we did go on to produce some population projections, but you'd kind of, <laughs> you'd, you'd get a self-answering question in a way if um, you projected climate change, but also made some projection around how infrastructure will update. Um, and if you, know, you, you make a choice about uh, how the nation's infrastructure might look like in 2050, um, alongside what the climate might be doing in 2050, and you see that infrastructure has managed to, to deal with that problem in its entirety, then it's quite, a, it's quite a tricky story to tell. And eventually your model becomes more than just a flood model. It's a model of everything. It's a model of politics and decisions about where gets defended and how much money is spent on these defenses. Uh, but it, it's of course very important to be, to be open about the fact that we're essentially, we have present day infrastructure in terms of how floods are managed and we're imposing greater hazard on those infrastructure, assuming that they don't keep pace. And just a note to all of our viewers today, we'll be talking specifically specifically about infrastructure tomorrow in uh, the lecture with Dr. Marcus Hendricks. Um, so Sony asks a kind of technical question, which I'm going to say as written, but I'd appreciate if you would kind of explain this for everybody. Um, are design storms taken into consideration while projecting flood for short and long term? Um, so in, in so far as I can follow the question anyway, so, so design storms um, are essentially what underpins everything that the model does. So rather than simulating floods during real flood events, as it were, what we are simulating is design storms. So the hundred year design flood um, everywhere across the nation. So it's, it's the hundred year flood map everywhere. Um, so, so that is fundamentally what, what the model represents. It's kind of a a theoretical thing, right? The hundred year flood, or perhaps we should talk about how we communicate what that really means in a, <laughs> in a separate question, but the hundred year flood everywhere, uh, simultaneously, which is not a real flood event. It's just, you know, a design. Um, and the way that the model works is we take all the US geological surveys, river gauges and work out at each point along the river, what that design flood would look like based on that information. And similarly for the Pluvial model, we take, um, it's called Noah's Atlas 14, which is a sort of catalog of, of design storms based on extreme rainfall of different durations. And that provides our kind of historical view of the design flood. And then, as I mentioned, the, the climate data essentially relatively changes those depending on the, the various quantities that, that are involved. So if we get a rainfall change, we apply that uplift or downlift onto um, those design storms, as it were. So I hope we got the nomenclature right and that was the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I have two more questions for you uh, and then we'll wrap up. So first from Susan, isn't the flood insurance fund already seriously underfunded? So how does that impact your suggestion that flood insurance be priced so that property owners and floodplains be charged equitably? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. And I guess it's, <laughs> it, it's more fundamental about whether we think that the federal flood insurance program should operate like an actuarially sound private business or whether it is really a means to provide aid to communities that require it. Um, obviously, when it comes to treating the National Flood Insurance Program as if it was an insurance company, it would have gone bust 
long time ago. You know, it, it is not a solvent business because fundamentally, the well, there, there are obviously lots of different problems and some are problems and some are not, depending on how you look at them. The fact that the National Flood Insurance Program is in debt uh, isn't really a problem, right? You know, the government funds it. That's what it's designed to be, is that the government takes the hit rather than individuals. And a matter of whether it's funded to fill that gap uh, is a matter for, for the government to decide. Um, so I guess that doesn't really matter so much. But one of the core problems that I alluded to really is that it's only the highest risk people that actually have to buy insurance, which is in violation of the point of insurance, right? The whole point is everybody pools together and low risk people pay a bit less, but they are, you know, funding, lots of low risk people are, are providing funding into this pool so that the high risk people um, can actually afford to live. Um, so if everybody across the United States had insurance, um, then a lot that problem would go away to some extent. But it's also, since it is a government program, do we really care that it's in debt? Uh, and that's not something I, as a, a humble Bristol-based flood modeler, can answer. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, I'm, I'm laughing at myself because we in the US have had a very similar conversation related to health insurance um, right. over the last decade, most, multiple decades. That's a different, that's a different lecture. So final, final question for you, which is a very good one for us to end on for Metcalf Institute. And that is in all of your work, um, trying to better uh, evaluate and project flood risk. What have you learned about communicating flood risk? Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a tricky question. I, I've learned a lot, but actually kind of crystallizing it into coherent answer is probably quite difficult. <laughs> um, I guess overall, it's important to be presenting any findings with with humility. Um, you know that there'll be a lot of a lot of model vendors or a lot of papers that that, that have a tendency to overclaim on the information content of their models or of their results. And it's actually more useful to explain what the model can't do and and kind of illustrate the bounds of 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 certainty, as it were. Uh, more so than essentially fooling people into thinking you're having an overly precise answer. Um, so doing that has been very important. You know, fundamentally, uncertainty is not a bad thing. I mean, risk and uncertainty are synonymous with one another. They're, they're an expression of one another. So it's not something to be avoided. It's something to be quantified and harnessed. You know, financial markets, insurers, people are, are, are used to dealing with risk. Uncertainty is just another form of that. Um, so that's important. Um, and I could probably keep answering this for another hour, but I guess, I guess I should just leave that there. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, and so with that, I, I thank you, Dr. Oliver Wang, uh, for this uh, really informative lecture and, and to all of you for joining us today. As a reminder, you can still register for the rest of this week's lectures by visiting metcalfinstitute.org. And Margaret just shared the link in the chat. And if you're inspired by these talks and want to support more of Metcalf Institute's work, we hope you'll make a gift today and get the extra thrill of knowing that your gift will be matched 100% if you give by, give by June, June 30th. Excuse me. So please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time again to hear from Dr. Marcus Hendricks from the University of, of Maryland about stormwater infrastructure and how to reconceive stormwater infrastructure for equitable outcomes. And until then, we thank you for your attention and we look forward to seeing you another time this week. Take care. <laughs>